This episode is made possible by Fabulous. Start building healthy habits and support this channel by checking out Fabulous at the link below. On this week's episode of Now That You're On The Left, You're Not Allowed To Enjoy Any Media, Hey, Stop It Right Now, presented by Second Thought, we're going to look at Hollywood's crucial role in the military-industrial complex. From Marxist analysis of superstructures, to FOIA documents, and the propaganda of the American Office of War Information, we're going to examine how it is that the American disease of perpetual war gains public support from our film industry. Come on, it's gonna be fun. We're doing a Marxist analysis of Shrek, but for all of Hollywood. So, where do we start? Well, a good place to begin talking about all of this is with the Department of Defense's direct involvement in Hollywood movies' depiction of the United States and its armed forces. To be clear, if you go to the DoD's website, they are very upfront about the fact that they are involved in Hollywood productions and in the way scripts for major blockbusters are written. What you might not expect is the, let's say, interesting way they like to phrase that involvement. Here's what the website reads. The Defense Department has a long-standing relationship with Hollywood. In fact, it's been working with filmmakers for nearly 100 years. Production agreements require the DoD to be able to review a rough cut of the film, so officials can decide if there are areas that need to be <clears throat> addressed before a film is released. While Hollywood is paid to tell a compelling story that will make money, the DoD is looking to tell an accurate story. Sure. We'll get to that last part in a second. But first, we should get an idea of the actual scale of DoD involvement. In a series of publicly accessible documents, you can get a list of all the movies and TV shows that the DoD admits publicly to have contributed to or denied assistance. The list goes back decades. And what's great about it is that there are little notes about what the DoD changed in each of these movies or the reasons they were refused assistance. For a good number of these movies, it's very clear that in return for access to military equipment and locations, which would otherwise be incredibly costly to reproduce for even big-budget studios, certain storylines and dialogues were altered or removed entirely. I've already talked on this channel about the media wing of the US military, specifically its influence on Twitch and in animated shorts targeting Gen Z in this video. Now that's a nice video. Boy, I love that video. You better watch that video after you're done with this video, I'll tell you right now. You won't forget, right? But that episode is focused on recruiting. While that is a major goal of the military's propaganda campaigns, and it's meant to make war institutions look wholesome and good, it's really just one part of a much bigger project. And it's also much more obvious what's going on. It's the military saying how the military is great on its own platform not on someone else's platform like a big-budget Hollywood movie. What the FOIA documents reveal is the much more subtle ways, the insinuations, the detailed rewrites that don't necessarily make the military look great, but that gloss over the realities that make it look bad, or that make sure more critical movies have a harder time getting produced, that they don't get access to the privileges the pro-military movies do. From the military's point of view, this kind of favoritism makes complete sense. Why would they promote a movie that makes them look bad by accurately reflecting the imperialist project the US has undertaken, especially since the end of the Second World War? They wouldn't, and they don't. The result of this favoritism is that the films that do get DoD support paint a pretty uniform image of the US military as heroic and exemplary in most cases, and only accidentally ineffective but ultimately well-meaning at the very most critical end of the spectrum. And because these pro-military movies end up saving so much on production costs and get access to military equipment and facilities for shoots, they are far more likely to get produced and to become blockbusters. It's the case for some MCU movies. It's Top Gun. It's Bond movies like Tomorrow Never Dies. Those are the movies that get DoD support and that get the cleanup treatment. Now, to be clear, movies that portray the military apparatus more accurately, with less of a rose-tinted hue, are still going to be made. But without State Department support, they might not reach the same blockbuster status as often, or to such a degree, as their more profitable box office neighbors. Surprisingly, the DoD's goal is incredibly transparent. Philip Strubb, director of entertainment media at the US Department of Defense, said it pretty plainly. Our desire is that the military are portrayed as good people trying to do the right thing the right way. That's probably our single most important imperative. And to make sure that it does happen that way, 
Military organizations are willing to leverage the billions they have at their disposal in the form of military equipment and shoot locations to keep the movies on that line of, the military can do no wrong. Here's another quote, this time from Robert Anderson, the Navy's Hollywood relations person. If you want full cooperation from the Navy, we have a considerable amount of power. Because it's our ships, it's our cooperation, and until the script is in a form that we can approve, then the production doesn't go forward. So, you know, that's the military's media relations team openly admitting to using Hollywood as a vehicle for pro-military propaganda. No big deal. But concretely, what does this influence look like? What needs to change for a script to be approved? To answer those questions, you could use literally hundreds of films and TV shows in that database, and the countless examples of how lines that don't exactly fit into the US's narrative have been, let's say, tweaked. For the sake of brevity, let's just take a couple. In the movie 12 Strong, DoD rewrites were minor, cleaning up the physical image of the protagonist and taking homophobic slurs out of their dialogue to present a more sanitized image of the elite American soldier. In the movie Lone Survivor, not so much. Rewrites included removing the main character's urge to commit war crimes and murder civilians while in Afghanistan. In the real story, no war crimes were committed, but they were considered by the military officer who ended up writing the book the movie was based on. In the movie, the protagonist has a clear conscience. No war criminal thoughts here, no sir. In Charlie Wilson's War, a movie meant to comedically recount the story of the US arming the Mujahideen, the sanitized, approved script removes from the original any mention of the US's support leading, at least in part, to the power Al-Qaeda and the Taliban would eventually accumulate. Sometimes it's a small rewrite, sometimes it's a big rewrite. Every time, though, the rewrite conceals some part of the truth, because the truth doesn't look good. These are just a few examples sourced from this article. There are hundreds more. And okay, look, I know how this sounds. It sounds like I'm peddling a conspiracy. How could something so clearly objectionable be going on with no one doing anything about it? These are possibly violations of the First Amendment. Government-sanctioned speech receiving preferential treatment is a problem, and the fact that it's being carried out by the US government itself to justify war? That seems like too big a deal not to be a bigger controversy. On my side of things, it feels weird, and probably does for you too, that to make my case I'm pulling up FOIA documents and sending you to websites you've probably never seen before. I get that. No offense to the Mint Press team, you guys do excellent work. Regardless of the evidence I have presented here, or the fact that much of it is coming directly from the mouths of the people involved, or that several articles linked in the description are published in mainstream media, it's going to sound like I'm some tinfoil hat wearing nut. The thing is, you don't have to believe me on this one fact, that the DoD is censoring Hollywood scripts, to be convinced that Hollywood as a whole is an institution that promotes the interests of the military-industrial complex. Even if the DoD had never addressed its involvement in the script writing of today's blockbusters, which we've seen it does, the existence of the beneficial relationship between our military and our entertainment industry is plain as day. And you can thank two pieces of evidence for that the history of military propaganda in the US, and thematic analyses of the last decade's most popular movies. Roll clip. After the United States enters the war in April 1917, President Woodrow Wilson knows that he needs to mobilize not just the American army, but the American people. And he knows that's a difficult task. So what Wilson does is he launches a massive campaign of propaganda that taps into every media that's available in America at the time. This includes newspapers, movies, posters, toys and games for children, all aspects of popular culture. That's a short clip from the National World War I Museum and Memorial YouTube channel. The rest of the video is in the description. What the host is talking about here is the propaganda efforts of the Committee on Public Information, a US agency that sprung up during the First World War. Posters, news articles, everywhere Americans looked, they were being sold the war effort by their government, including in movies. And wouldn't you know it, it really worked. Most Americans were on board with the war just years after many were firmly opposed to American involvement or simply disinterested. Movies like the animated short The Sinking of the Lusitania galvanized American public support for the war. 
presenting U.S. entry into the conflict as a moral duty, rather than getting the country to rally behind the more accurate and crucial role that war profiteering played in the decision to ship soldiers abroad. Less relevant to the war, but a great example of this sort of propaganda effort, is the white supremacist movie The Birth of a Nation, widely credited to have revived the KKK in the early 20th century. As it happens, that movie was the first Hollywood venture to receive military support, according to Tanner Murley's book Hearts and Minds, The U.S. Empire's Culture Industry. The reason it's an important tangent is because its box office success supposedly proved to then-President Wilson the effectiveness of movies as a popular medium for propaganda, triggering much of the subsequent military involvement in Hollywood. After World War I, the CPI shuts down and the story picks up in World War II, when the Office of War Information creates the Bureau of Motion Pictures. What's the point of a motion pictures bureau, you ask? Let's consult the head of the OWI, Elmer Davis. The motion picture is the most powerful instrument of propaganda in the world, whether it tries to be or not. The easiest way to inject a propaganda idea into most people's minds is to let it go through the medium of an entertainment picture when they do not realize that they are being propagandized. Elmer, my guy, I don't think you're supposed to say that part out loud. And this kept going. The majority of the big war films that came out between the start of the Cold War until the 60s, and then once again from the 80s to the present, have done so under the direction, approval, and support of the DoD. Okay, that doesn't sound good, but why does any of this really matter? Here we get to the Marxist analysis of superstructures, and you'll see it's a really helpful concept we can use to break this stuff down. To be very, very brief about it, superstructures in Marxist analysis are the elements of our society that aren't directly economic. Law, media, culture, religion, education, whatever you want. If it's something that molds or represents a form of ideology, some ideas we can have about the world, it's probably going to be part of the superstructure. Let's focus on culture. According to Marxist theorists, the production of cultural texts, like movies, is rooted in and influenced by the economic context in which it appears, and in a mutually reinforcing way, can often come to justify and support that economic situation. TLDR, not only does the idea behind the creation of a random movie get influence from its environment, that's not too difficult to imagine, so too does its ability to be distributed widely, to reach many people, to interest an audience. It needs to be relevant to someone to get made, and so will often find relevance by reaffirming the present societal order. In a neoliberal, imperial, capitalist society like the US, which has lived war to war for close to a century, it should be pretty obvious that war is going to feature prominently in our culture. It makes it into so many films, not just because it satisfies someone's monetary interest when it does, but because we couldn't not talk about it. The sinister part of that inevitable truth about media in a society is that the military's influence on media in our society is so large, meaning that even if we want to talk about war more critically, that type of cultural production will always be at a disadvantage. But okay, let's assume that there wasn't any military influence at all. That the DoD had never, and to this day does not, give a leg up to pro-army movies or effectively censor its critics. If you look at the biggest blockbusters of the last decade, you'll have an incredibly easy time finding that they glorify or offer only weak, superficial critiques to the military apparatus and its logic of imperialism. Look, I'm not a film critic, by the way. Just like you, I watch stuff with my friends, point to the TV screen, and say, that's actually a metaphor for capitalism, and look down while everybody rolls their eyes. But I don't have to be a good film critic. I have YouTube. Both this video by the channel Skip Intro, and this one by the channel Just Right, are great and thorough breakdowns of the way American exceptionalism and imperialism come to be justified in a prototypical example of pro-military media. The Captain America movies The First Avenger and The Winter Soldier two movies that unsurprisingly benefited from a close collaboration with the DoD. Throughout the films, America's role as a global superpower, embodied in Steve Rogers' his character, is hardly interrogated. He has great power, but he's being a very responsible little man and doesn't abuse it because he's just a good dude and so is America, by the way. Just trust me on that one. Come on, guys, would I ever lie to you about this? No, of course not. 
So in these movies, when US institutions are brought under scrutiny and the heroes turn against S.H.I.E.L.D., the organization meant to represent the Department of Homeland Security, the only real problem the movie ends up portraying with the institution is that it was infiltrated by the evil Hydra. S.H.I.E.L.D. in and of itself was always okay. We just need to get rid of the baddies and then we can get back to the completely justified global police stuff. Those are just two movies, but these kinds of messages are rife in American cinema and are discussed a lot more thoroughly in the videos I've linked in the description. And the reason I'm even talking about this is that the result of all these thematic implications is that the overall picture we get of the US and its military efforts is not one characterized by the greed behind domination of oil or other natural reserves in the Middle East, the subjugation or outright murder of civilians by military occupation and drone strikes, or the unjustifiable interventions made to oust popular and democratically elected leaders across the world. Thanks to Hollywood, the military almost exclusively looks like a force for good, an industry we can keep justifying giving nearly a trillion dollars to every year so that the Lockheed Martins and Boeings of the world can continue driving up their stock prices. Movies have powerful propaganda potential, and in giving us only weak tools to critique the military, if any at all, they have successfully allowed for the continuous American support for its most massive imperial project to date. Of course, as media consumers, we're not just passive propaganda sponges. But in the absence of good, popular critiques, and under a barrage of pro-military propaganda, even our best defenses can weaken over time. Just something to keep in mind. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that this episode is made possible by Fabulous. Let me tell you why. As I've told you all before, it's pretty hard to get sponsors on my channel. That's partly due to the nature of my content, and partly because I'm very picky regarding what brands I'll work with. I get a lot of comments about how my content can be kind of depressing, which is true. I tackle a lot of heavy topics. I have been trying to add more humor recently, but there's no avoiding the fact that talking about major problems can be disheartening or overwhelming. One way I combat these feelings is by trying to maintain healthy habits, like going to the gym, making sure I drink plenty of water, stuff like that. So when I got the offer to work with Fabulous, it was a no-brainer. If you haven't heard of Fabulous, it's an app based on behavioral science that helps you build and maintain healthy habits. What I like about it is that it's 100% personalized. It doesn't force you into one style of habit building. You have options based on your preferred approach. You can either tell the app exactly what habits you want to focus on, or you can use Journeys, specially crafted habit building programs that guide you towards your goals. One thing that sets Fabulous apart is that it's actually backed by science. It's not just vague self-improvement mumbo jumbo, this is concrete stuff that you can do to develop healthy habits that will stick. There's a reason Fabulous is the number one self-care app for building better habits and achieving your goals. It's because it works. Personally, I've been using Fabulous to make stretching part of my daily routine. It's done wonders to fix my editing back pain and to improve my overall feeling of accomplishment just by checking that off my list every morning. Like I said, I don't work with a sponsor unless I 100% believe in their mission and their product. And Fabulous has earned that recommendation. As an added perk for fans of Second Thought, if you're one of the first 100 people to sign up using the link below, you can get 25% off Fabulous Premium, which comes with some really cool added features, like daily coaching and unlimited habits in your routines. So if you'd like to join me in overcoming those feelings of anxiety or depression, I highly recommend you give Fabulous a shot. It works, and it really does help support me and the content I produce. Check it out by following the link in the description. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous videos by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.